section twenty eight of egypt africa and arabia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world's story volume three egypt africa and arabia edited by eva march tappan section twenty eight in the brickfields by rev j h ingram about twenty stadia or nearly four miles from the city we came suddenly upon a vast desolate field upon which thousands of men seemed to be engaged in the occupation of making brick as we drew near for the royal road we were traversing passed directly through this busy multitude i saw by their faces that the toilers were of that mysterious race the hebrew people i say mysterious for though i have now been six weeks in egypt i have not yet found any of the egyptians who can tell me whence came this nation now in bondage to the pharaohs either those whom i questioned were ignorant of their rise or purposely refrained from talking with a foreigner upon the subject you will remember that i once inquired of rameses as to their origin and present degradation and he said he would at some other time reply to my question since then i have had no opportunity of introducing the subject again to him other objects wholly absorbing our attention when we met yet in the interim i was forced irresistibly to notice these people and their hard tasks for though they were never seen in the streets mingling with the citizens save only in palaces where handsome hebrew youths often serve as pages yet where temples and granaries and walls and arsenals and treasure-houses were being erected they were to be found in vast numbers old and young men women and children without distinction were engaged in the plain across which we moved pardon me noble prince i said permit me to linger a moment to survey this novel scene rameses drew up his horses and from the chariot i cast my eyes over the vast level which embraced half a square league these fields sesostris said the prince are where the bricks are made which are to erect the walls of the treasure city one of the towers of which you behold two miles distant the city itself will take the years of a generation of this people to complete if the grand design is carried out on the left of the tower you see the old palace for this is not a new city we are building so much as an extension of the old on a new site and with greater magnificence it is my mother's pride to fill egypt with monuments of architecture that will mark her reign as an era the scene that i beheld from the height of the chariot i will attempt to describe as far as i could see the earth was dark with people some stooping down and with wooden mattocks digging up the clay others were piling it into heaps others were chopping straw to mix with the clay others were treading it with their feet to soften it some with moulds were shaping the clay into bricks another stood by with the queen's mark and stamped each brick therewith or the one which was to be the head of a course when laid there were also the strongest men employed in raising upon the shoulders of others a load of these bricks which they bore to a flat open space to be dried in the sun and a procession of many hundreds was constantly moving performing this task some of the slaves carried yokes which had cords at each end to which bricks were fastened and many of the young men conveyed masses of clay upon their heads to the moulders those who carried the brick to the smoothly swept ground where they were to be dried delivered them to women 
who many hundreds in number placed them side by side on the earth in rows a lighter task than that of the men the borders of this busy plain where it touched the fields of stubble wheat were thronged with women and children gathering straw for the men who mixed the clay it was an active and busy spectacle yet throughout the vast arena not a voice was heard from the thousands of toilers only the sharp authoritative tones of their taskmasters broke the stillness or the creaking of carts with wooden wheels as laden with straw from the distant fields they moved slowly over the plain the labourers were divided into companies or parties of from a score to one hundred persons over whom stood or was seated an egyptian officer these taskmasters were not only distinguishable from the labourers by their linen bonnet or cap with a cape descending to the neck but by a scarlet or striped tunic and a rod or whip of a single thong or of small cords these men watch closely the workmen who naked above the waist with only a loin-cloth upon many of them worked each moment in fear of the lash the taskmaster showed no mercy but if the labourer sunk under his burden he was punished on the spot and left to perish if he were dying and his burden transferred to the shoulders of another so vast was the multitude of these people that the death of a score a day would not have been regarded indeed their increase already alarms the egyptians and their lives therefore are held in little estimation the vast revenue however accruing to the crown from this enslaved nation of brickmakers leads to regulations which in a great measure check the destructive rigour of the taskmasters for not only are thousands building cities but tens of thousands are dispersed all over lower egypt who make brick to sell to nobles and citizens the crown having the monopoly of this branch of labour interest alone has not prompted the queen to make laws regulating their treatment and lessening the rigour of their lot but also humanity which is however an attribute in its form of pity little cultivated in egypt under the preceding pharaohs for seventy years the condition of these hebrews was far more severe than it has been under the milder reign of the queen i am assured that she severely punishes all unnecessary cruelty and has lightened the tasks of the women who also may not be punished with blows i surveyed this interesting and striking scene with emotions of wonder and commiseration i could not behold without the deepest pity venerable and august-looking old men with grey heads and flowing white beards smeared with clay stooping over the wooden moulds coarsely clad in the blue and grey loin-cloth which scarcely concealed their nakedness or fine youths bareheaded and burned red with the sun toiling like cattle under heavy burdens here and there upon a naked shoulder visible a fresh crimson line where the lash or the rod of an angered officer had left its mark there were young girls too whose beautiful faces though sunburned and neglected would have been the envy of fair ladies in any court these as well as the others of their sex wore a sort of tight gown of coarse material tied at the neck with short close sleeves reaching to the elbow their black or brown hair was tied in a knot behind or cut short and occasionally i saw a plain silver or other metallic ring upon a small hand showing that even bondage has not destroyed in woman the love of jewels as we rode along those egyptians who were near the road bowed the knee to the prince and remained stationary until he passed we rode for a mile and a half through this brick field when at its extremity we came upon a large mean town of huts composed of reeds and covered with straw 
there said rameses are the dwellings of the laborers you have seen these huts formed long streets or lanes which intersected each other in all directions there was not a tree to shade them the streets and doors were crowded with children and old hebrew women who were left to watch them while their parents were in the field there seemed to be a dozen children to every house and some of five and six years were playing at brick-making one of their number acting as a taskmaster holding a whip which he used with a willingness and frequency that showed how well the egyptian officers had taught the lesson of severity and cruelty to the children of their victims in these huts dwelt forty thousand hebrews who were engaged either in making brick or conveying them to rameses close at hand or in placing them in mortar upon the walls we passed through the very midst of this wretched village of bondmen whose only food in their habitations is garlic and leeks and fish or flesh their drink the turbid water of the nile unfiltered from its impurities by means of porous stone and paste of almonds a process of art so well known to the egyptians on the skirts of the village was a vast burial place without a tomb or stone for these hebrews are too poor and miserable to embalm their dead even if customs of their own did not lead them to place them in the earth the aspect of this melancholy place of sepulture was gloomy enough it had the look of a vast ploughed plain but infinitely desolate and hideous when the imagination pictured the corruption that lay beneath each narrow mound i felt a sensation of relief when we left this spot behind and drove upon a green plateau which lay between it and the treasure city of the king the place we were crossing had once been the garden of hermes or yosef the celebrated prince who about one hundred and thirty years ago saved the inhabitants of egypt from perishing by famine having received from the god osiris knowledge of a seven years famine to befall the kingdom after seven years of plenty this prince yosef or joseph was also called hermes though he wrote not all the books attributed to hermes as we in phoenicia understand of that personage was this joseph an egyptian i asked of the prince rameses as we dashed past the ruins of a palace in the midst of the gardens no a hebrew he answered he was the favourite of the phoenician pharaoh who commenced the palaces of this city of treasure a hebrew i exclaimed not one of the race i behold about me tolling toward the city with sun-dried bricks upon their heads and whom i have seen at work on the plain of bricks of the same he answered your reply reminds me o rameses that you have promised to relate to me the history of this remarkable people who evidently from their noble physiognomies belong to a superior race i will redeem my promise my dear sesostris he said smiling as soon as i have left the chariot by yonder ruined well where i see the architect and his people whom i have come hither to meet await me with their drawings and rules we soon drove up to the spot having passed several fallen columns which had once adorned the baths of the house of this hebrew prince who had once been such a benefactor to egypt but as he was the favourite of a phoenician king the present dynasty neglect his monuments as well as deface all those which the shepherd kings erected to perpetuate their conquest hence it is i find scarcely a trace of the dominion in lower egypt of this race of kings the ruined well was a massive quadrangle of stone and was called the fountain of the strangers it was in ruins yet the well itself sparkled with clear water as in its ancient days grouped upon a stone platform beneath the shade of three palms stood the party of artists who awaited the prince their horses and the cars in which they came or brought their instruments stood near held by slaves who were watering the animals from the fountain upon the approach of the prince these persons the chief of whom was attired handsomely as a man of rank for architects in egypt are nobles and are in high place at court bowed the knee reverently before him he alighted from his chariot and at once began to examine their drawings leaving him engaged in a business which i perceived would occupy him some time 
i walked about looking at the ancient fountain in order to obtain a view of the country i ascended a tower at one of its angles which elevated me sixty feet above the plain from this height i beheld the glorious city of the sun a league and a half to the north rising above its girdle of gardens in all its splendour in the mid distance lay the plain of brick workers covered with its tens of thousands of busy workers in clay then nearer still stretched their squalid city of huts and the gloomy burial place bordering on the desert at the farther boundary turning to the south the treasure city of rameses lay before me the one half ancient and ruinous but the other rising in grand outlines and vast dimensions stretching even to the nile which shining and majestic flowed to the west of it farther still the pyramids of memphis the city itself of apis and the walls and temples of Giza towered in noble perspective the nile was lively with galleys ascending and descending and upon the road that followed its banks many people were moving either on foot in palanquins chariots or upon horseback over the whole scene the bright sun shone giving life and brightness to all i beheld to the east the illimitable desert stretched far away and i could trace the brown line of road along which the caravans travel between the nile cities and the port of suez on the sea of ezion geber in order to unlaid there for ships from farther end that are awaiting them almost beneath the crumbling tower on which i stood taking in this wide view of a part of the populous valley of the nile wound a broad path well trodden by thousands of naked feet it was now crowded with hebrew slaves some going to the city with burdens of brick slung at the extremities of wooden yokes laid across the shoulder or borne upon their heads and others returning to the plain after having deposited their burdens it was a broad path of tears and sighs and no loitering step was permitted by the overseers for even if one would stop to quench his thirst at the fountain he was beaten forward and the blows accompanied with execrations alas this cruel bondage of the hebrews is the only dark spot which i have seen in egypt the only shadow of evil upon the brilliant reign of queen Amense. i took one more survey of the wide landscape which embraces the abodes of one million of souls for in the valley of egypt are fourteen thousand villages towns and cities and a population of nearly seven millions yet the valley of the nile is a belt of verdure only a few miles wide bounded by the libyan and arabian hills every foot of soil seems occupied and every acre teems with population in the streets in the gardens in the public squares in temples and courts of palaces in the field or on the river one can never be alone for he sees human beings all about him thronging every place and engaged either in business or pleasure or the enjoyment of the luxury of idleness in the shade of a column or a tree descending the tower and seeing the prince still engaged with his builders pointing to the unfinished towers of rameses and the site of the new palace he proposed erecting near by i went down the steps to the fountain to quaff its cool waters here i beheld an old and majestic-looking man bending over a youth a wound in whose temple he was bathing tenderly with water from the well i perceived at a glance from the aquiline nose and lash-shaded dark bright eye that they were hebrews the old man had one of those abrahamic faces i have described as extant on the tomb of eliezer of damascus a broad extensive and high forehead a boldly shaped eagle nose full lips and a flowing beard which would have been white as wool but that it was stained yellow by the sun and soil he wore the coarse short trousers and body cloth of the bond-slave and old sandals bound upon his feet with ropes 
the young man was similarly dressed he was pale and nearly lifeless his beautiful head lay upon the edge of the fountain and as the old man poured from the palm of his hand water upon his face he repeated a name perhaps the youth's i stood fixed with interest by the scene at this moment an egyptian taskmaster entered and with his rod struck the venerable man several sharp blows and ordered him to rise and go to his task he made no reply regarded not the shower of blows but bending his eyes tearfully upon the marble face before him with his fingers softly removed the warm drops of blood that stained the temples nay i said quickly to the egyptian do not beat him see he is old and is caring for this poor youth the egyptian looked at me with an angry glance as if he would also chastise the speaker for interfering when seeing from my appearance that i was a man of rank and perceiving also the prince through a passage in the ruined wall he bent his forehead low and said my lord i did not see you or i would have taken the idle greybeard out and beaten him but why beat him i asked his load awaits him on the road where he dropped it when my second officer struck down this young fellow who stopped to gaze at a chariot what relation do they bear to each other said i this is the old man's youngest son he is a weak fool my lord about him and though as you see he can hardly carry a full load for himself he will try and add to his own a part of the bricks the boy should bear come old man leave the boy and on to your work the aged hebrew raised to my face a look of despair trembling with mute appeal as if he expected no interposition yet had no other hope left leave them here i said i will be responsible for the act but i am under a chief captain who will make me account to him for every brick not delivered the tale of bricks that leaves the plain and that which is received are taken and compared i have a certain number of men and boys under me and they have to make up in their loads a given tale of bricks between son and son if they fail i lose my wages this was spoken sullenly what is thy day's wages i demanded a quarter of a scarabaeus he answered this is the common cheap coin bearing the sacred beetle cut in stone copper lead and even wood higher values are represented by silver bronze brass and gold rings money in disc form i have not yet heard of in egypt an egyptian's purse is a necklace of gold rings of greater or less value the scarabaeus is often broken in four pieces each fraction containing a hieroglyphic the value is about equal to a syrian nefer i placed in his hand a copper scarabaeus and said go thy way this shall justify thee to thy conscience these hebrews are too helpless to be of further service to thee this day the taskmaster took the money with a smile of gratification and at once left the court of the fountain the old hebrew looked at me with grateful surprise caught my hand pressed it to his heart and then covered it with kisses i smiled upon him with friendly sympathy and stooping down raised the head of the young man upon my knee by our united aid he was soon restored to sensibility he surveyed me with mingled fear and wonder my lord is good fear him not israel said the old man the youth looked incredulous and had his strength permitted would have fled away from me i said i am not thy taskmaster dread not my presence the tone of my voice reassured him he smiled gently and an expression of gladness lighted up his eyes a drop of blood trickled down his forehead and increased the paleness of his skin what is thy name i asked the old man speaking in syriac for in that tongue i had heard him murmur the name of his son and i have since found that all hebrews of the older class speak this language or rather syro chaldaic they also understand and speak the egyptian vernacular ben isaac my lord he answered art thou in bondage i and my children as my fathers were 
what brought thee and thy people into the servitude it is a sad history my lord art thou then a stranger in egypt that thou art ignorant of the story of the hebrew i am a phoenician i have been but a few weeks in egypt phoenicia that is beyond edom nay beyond philistia he said musingly our fathers came farther even from palestine who were your fathers abraham isaac and jacob i have heard of them three princes of syria many generations past yes my lord of phoenicia said the venerable man his eyes lighting up they were princes in their land but lo this day behold their children in bondage and such a servitude he cried raising his withered hands heavenward death my lord is preferable to it how long must we groan in slavery how long our little ones bear the yoke of egypt at this moment one of the footmen of prince rameses found me and said my lord prince seeks for thee i put money in the hands of the venerable hebrew and his son and left them amid their expressions of grateful surprise End of section twenty eight this recording is in the public domain section twenty nine of egypt africa and arabia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world's story volume three egypt africa and arabia edited by eva march tappan section twenty nine let my people go by theophile gautier translated by augusta mcsee wright timoft raising one hand to his head and lowering the other to the ground now entered the apartment o king said he a mysterious person demands an audience with you his immense beard descends to his waist there are shiny protuberances like horns upon his bald forehead a strange power precedes him all the guards make way for him and all the doors stand open what he orders must be done and i was obliged to come to you and disturb your happiness even though i should suffer death for my audacity what is his name demanded the king moses replied timoft the king passed into another room to receive moses and seated himself upon a throne with arms shaped like lions he fastened a large pectoral about his neck grasped his sceptre and assumed a pose of superb indifference moses appeared another hebrew named aaron accompanied him august as pharaoh was upon his golden throne surrounded by his ores and bearers of flabella in that room with its high ceiling supported by enormous columns and its painted walls representing his own great deeds and those of his ancestors moses was no less imposing the majesty of age in this instance equalled the royal majesty although he was eighty years of age he seemed full of manly vigour and there was nothing about him indicating decay or senility the lines in his forehead and cheeks were like incisions in granite making him appear venerable without establishing his age his brown and wrinkled neck was attached to his broad shoulders by lean but still powerful muscles and a network of thick veins covered his hands that did not tremble like those of an old man a stronger spirit than the human spirit animated his body and his face shone even in the shadow with a singular light that seemed like the reflection of an invisible sun without prostrating himself as was customary when approaching the king moses advanced towards pharaoh's throne saying thus saith the lord god of israel let my people go that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness pharaoh replied who is the lord that i should obey his voice to let israel go i know not the lord neither will i let israel go not intimidated by the king's answer the stately old man repeated with great distinctness for the hesitation that troubled him formerly had disappeared 
the god of the hebrews hath met with us let us go we pray you three days journey into the desert and sacrifice unto the lord our god lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword aaron bowed his head confirming moses words why do you take the people from their work demanded pharaoh get you unto your burdens happily for you i am in a clement mood to-day or i should have had you beaten with rods your noses and ears cut off and your living bodies thrown to the crocodiles no even as i now declare it to you that there is no other god but amon ra the supreme and primordial being at the same time male and female his own father and his own mother of whom he is also the husband from him descend all the other gods that unite heaven and earth and that are only different forms of the two constituent principles the wise men know it and the priests who have long studied the mysteries in the colleges and within the temples consecrated to the divers representations do not bring forward another god of your own invention to incite the hebrews to revolt and prevent the completion of the work they are engaged upon your pretext of sacrifice is transparent you want to escape depart from before my face and continue to make brick for my royal and sacerdotal buildings for my pyramids my palaces and my walls go i have spoken moses seeing that he could not move pharaoh's heart and that if he insisted he should only excite his wrath retired in silence followed by the dismayed aaron i have obeyed the commands of the lord said moses to his companion when they had passed out through the pylon but pharaoh remained as insensible as if i had been addressing one of those men of granite seated on thrones at the palace gates or those idols with the head of a dog an ape or a hawk before whom the priests burn incense in the temples what shall we say to the people when they ask us how we succeeded pharaoh fearing that the israelites might take it into their heads to shake off the yoke if they should listen to moses made them work harder still and refused them straw to mix with their bricks so the children of israel went about egypt pulling up the stubble and cursing the taskmasters for they were very unhappy and they said that the schemes of moses had only increased their misery one day moses and aaron appeared again at the palace and once more challenged pharaoh to suffer the israelites to go into the desert and sacrifice to the lord how can you prove demanded pharaoh that you are indeed sent by the lord to tell me these things and that you are not as i suspect only vile impostors aaron threw down his rod before pharaoh and the wood began to twist and writhe to clothe itself in scales to move the head and tail to erect itself and to hiss horribly the rod had become a serpent its coils rattled upon the slabs and dilating its throat thrusting out its forked tongue and rolling its red eyes about it seemed to be looking for a victim to strike the oeris the attendants about the throne were paralyzed and speechless with fright at the sight of such a miracle the bravest had partly drawn their swords but pharaoh was not in the least disturbed a disdainful smile flitted over his lips and he said so this is all that you have to show me the miracle is insignificant and the trick commonplace summon my wise men magicians and hieroglyphists they appeared they were persons of formidable and mysterious aspect with shaven heads and papyrus sandals on their feet 
wearing long linen garments and carrying canes engraved with hieroglyphics they were yellow and dried up like mummies from late hours study and an austere manner of living the fatigue of successive initiations had set its seal upon their countenances no part of which seemed alive but the eyes they took their places in a line before pharaoh's throne without paying any attention to the serpent that was still writhing stretching out its neck and hissing can you demanded the king turn your sticks into reptiles as aaron has just done in our presence o oh, king is it for this child's play said the most venerable one of the band that we have been called from our cells where under starry ceilings by the light of lamps we meditate leaning over undecipherable papyri kneeling before obelisks with their hieroglyphics of deep and mysterious meaning unravelling the secrets of nature calculating the power of numbers laying our trembling hands upon the hem of the veil of great isis let us return for life is short and the learned has barely time to pass over to his successor the problem he has solved suffer us to go back to our work the first juggler the Sia who sounds his flute in the squares will perform what you ask footnote Sia, serpent charmer end of footnote enana do what i have demanded said pharaoh to the leader of the hieroglyphists and magicians old enana turned towards the college of sages who stood there motionless their minds already buried again in the abyss of meditation throw your sticks upon the ground and pronounce the incantation the canes fell from their hands upon the stone floor with a clatter and the wise men resumed their perpendicular pose like that of the statues leaning against the pillars of the temples they did not even deign to glance down at their feet to see whether the miracle had been accomplished so sure were they of the formula it was a strange and horrible spectacle the canes curled up like green twigs in the fire their extremities flattened out into heads or tapered away in tails some remaining smooth and others growing scaly according to the kind of serpent here they rattled there they rose up erect on this side they hissed and on that wound through themselves making hideous knots they were vipers bearing the mark of an iron lance on their bruised heads serastes with their threatening horns greenish and slimy hydras asps with movable fangs glass snakes yellow trigonophcephali crotalidae with short nose and black skin sounding their rattles amphisvinidae moving backward and forward boas opening their huge jaws wide enough to swallow the bull apis serpents with their eyes encircled by discs like those of the owl the floor of the room swarmed with them tahoser who was sitting beside pharaoh upon his throne drew her beautiful naked feet up under her pale with terror well said pharaoh to moses you see that the skill of my hieroglyphists equals or surpasses your own their sticks have produced serpents like that of aaron therefore if you wish me to believe in you perform some other miracle moses extended his hand and aaron's serpent sprang upon the twenty-four reptiles the struggle did not last long it soon swallowed the fearful animals apparent or real creations of the egyptian magicians then it resumed the form of a stick this result seemed to astonish anana he bowed his head pondered and finally said like one who has weighed the subject i will discover the word and symbol i have not interpreted aright 
the fourth hieroglyphic of the fifth perpendicular line where the conjuration of serpents is to be found o king is our presence still required asked the chief hieroglyphist haughtily i would fain resume my reading of hermes trismegistus which contains secrets of a very different character from these tricks of legerdemain pharaoh made a sign to the old man that he was permitted to retire and the silent cortege disappeared again in the depths of the palace the king re-entered the geneseum with tahoser the daughter of the priest still frightened and trembling on account of what she had witnessed knelt before him and besought him o pharaoh do you not fear to irritate by your resistance this unknown god to whom the israelites want to celebrate a feast a three days journey from here in the desert suffer moses and his people to perform their rites or it may be that the lord as he is called will punish egypt and we shall die what has this serpent jugglery alarmed you exclaimed pharaoh did you not see my magicians also turn their sticks into reptiles yes but aaron's devoured them all and it is a bad omen what does it signify am i not the favourite of frey and the beloved of amon ra have i not the figures of the conquered upon my sandals when it pleases me i will sweep out of sight with a breath all this hebrew race and we shall see whether their god can protect them have a care pharaoh returned tahoser who remembered what peori had said concerning the power of jehovah do not let pride harden your heart moses and aaron fill me with dread to have braved your displeasure they must be supported by a very terrible god if their god were so powerful said pharaoh in answer to tahoser's fears would he leave them in bondage humble and uncomplaining as beasts of burden under the severest tasks let us forget these idle miracles and dismiss all anxiety think only of my love for you and believe that pharaoh has more power than the lord this visionary divinity of the hebrews yes i know that you are the subduer of nations the controller of thrones and that men are no more in your path than grains of sand blown about by the southern wind replied to hoser and yet i cannot make you love me said pharaoh smiling the ibex is afraid of the lion the dove dreads the hawk the eye cannot gaze at the sun and i am still bewildered and terrified in your presence human weakness cannot accustom itself at once to the majesty of a king a god always frightens a mortal you make me regret to hose it that i was not the first in your affections whether as an o iris a monarch a priest an agriculturist or even something still more humble but if i do not know how to make a man of a king i can make a woman a queen and i will deck your fair brow with the golden viper the queen will no longer fear the king even though you should place me beside you on your throne in my thoughts i would still be kneeling at your feet but you are so good in spite of your supernatural beauty your unlimited power and the effulgence surrounding you that perhaps my heart will take courage and dare to beat in response to yours it was thus that pharaoh and tahoser discoursed the daughter of the priest could not forget poeri and sought to gain time by flattering the passion of the king with a little hope to escape from the palace and go to rejoin the young hebrew was an impossibility poeri on the other hand accepted her love rather than shared it rachel notwithstanding her generosity was a dangerous rival and then pharaoh's tenderness touched tahoser she would have been glad if she could have loved him and perhaps she was not so far from it as she fancied 
some days later pharaoh was driving along the shore of the nile standing upright in his chariot and followed by his train of attendants he was on his way to see what degree the river had attained when moses and aaron appeared before him in the midst of the road like phantoms the king reined in his horses that had already shaken the foam from their bits upon the chest of the stately and motionless old man moses with a slow and solemn voice repeated his adjuration prove the power of your god by some miracle replied the king and i will grant what you ask turning towards aaron who followed him at a little distance moses said take your rod and stretch out your hand upon the waters of egypt upon their streams upon their rivers upon their ponds and upon all their pools of water that they may become blood and that there may be blood throughout all the land of egypt both in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone aaron lifted up his rod and smote the waters that were in the river pharaoh's attendants awaited the result with anxiety the king who bore a heart of brass in a chest of granite smiled scornfully trusting to the skill of his hieroglyphists to confound these foreign magicians as soon as the rod of the hebrew that rod which had been a serpent touched the river the waters began to stir and seethe their muddy appearance underwent a perceptible change a reddish tinge manifested itself then the whole mass became a deep crimson and the nile was turned into a river of blood rolling high its scarlet waves and tossing a pink froth upon the shores it looked as if it mirrored a tremendous conflagration or a sky rent with lightning but the atmosphere was calm thebes was not on fire and the unchangeable blue spread itself over this red stream dotted here and there with the white bellies of the dead fish long scaly crocodiles helped themselves up on the banks of the stream with their crooked legs and ponderous hippopotamuses like great blocks of red granite covered with a black leprous scum fled through the rushes or lifted their enormous muzzles above the surface unable to breathe in the bloody water the canals ponds and pools were all of the same colour and the jars containing water were as red as the craters that received the blood of victims pharaoh was unmoved by this prodigy and said to the two hebrews this miracle may terrify a credulous and ignorant populace but there is nothing in it that surprises me let inanna and the college of hieroglyphists be summoned they will perform the same trick the hieroglyphists led by their chief arrived inanna glanced at the river with its red waves and knew what was required of him restore everything to its former state said he to moses companion that i may work the same enchantment aaron smote the stream once more and it resumed its normal colour inanna made a sign of approval like an impartial savant doing justice to the skill of a brother he found the thing well done for one who had never had like himself a chance to study science in the mysterious chambers of the labyrinth where only a few of the initiated could enter the tests were so severe it is my turn now said he and he stretched out his cane engraved with hieroglyphics over the nile muttering some words in a language so old that it must have been unintelligible even in the time of menes the first king of egypt a language of the sphinx with syllables of granite an immense red flood spread from shore to shore instantaneously and the nile began once more to roll onward with its bloody waves towards the sea the twenty-four hieroglyphists saluted the king as if about to retire remain said pharaoh they resumed again their impassable look have you no other proof to give of your mission but this my wise men as you see imitate your enchantments without any trouble not disconcerted by the irony of the king moses said to him in seven days if you do not suffer 
the children of israel to go into the desert so that they may sacrifice unto the lord according to their ceremonies i will return and perform another miracle in your presence at the end of seven days moses returned he repeated to his servant aaron the words of the almighty stretch forth your hand with the rod over the streams over the rivers and over the ponds and cause frogs to come up upon the land of egypt as soon as aaron had stretched forth his hand millions of frogs came up from river canal stream and marsh they covered the fields and the roads hopped up the steps of the temples and palaces invaded the sanctuaries and the most retired apartments and new legions were ever following after the first the houses were full of them the kneading troughs the ovens the chests one could not plant his foot anywhere without crushing one as if on springs they jumped between the legs on the right on the left forward and back away in the distance you could see them plashing about leaping clambering over each other for already there was scarcely room for them and their ranks closed together and were heaped and piled one upon another out in the country their innumerable green backs looked like fresh and verdant meadows in which their yellow eyes were the flowers the animals horses asses and goats irritated and frightened fled across the fields only to encounter on all sides this unclean germination pharaoh who contemplated from the threshold of his palace the rising flood of frogs with an air of disgust and annoyance crushed as many as he could with the end of his sceptre and pushed away others with the curved toe of his sandal vain efforts newcomers springing from one could not tell where replaced the dead more lively more noisy more unclean more troublesome and more daring thrusting out their spinal columns fixing their great round eyes upon him spreading out their webbed feet and wrinkling their white throats the repulsive creatures seemed endowed with intelligence and the layers were thicker about the king than elsewhere the living tide rose higher and higher on the knees of the colossi on the cornices of the pylons on the backs of the sphinxes and creosphinxes on the entablatures of the temples on the shoulders of the gods on the pyramidal points of the obelisk the hideous little beasts with their backs hunched up and their toes spread out had taken up their position the ibises which had rejoiced at first over this unexpected windfall prodding them with their long beaks and swallowing them by the hundreds now began to be alarmed at the prodigious invasion and flew up towards the zenith clapping their bills aaron and moses had triumphed anana being summoned seemed to be lost in thought with his fingers upon his bald brow and his eyes half closed he looked as if he were searching in his mind for some forgotten magic formula pharaoh annoyed turned towards him well anana by dint of dreaming have you lost your mind and is this miracle beyond your power by no means o king but when one measures the infinite computes eternity and unriddles the incomprehensible he may happen not to have at his tongue's end the strange sentence that has power over reptiles bringing them into existence or destroying them behold now all of this vermin shall disappear the old hieroglyphist waved his wand muttering a few syllables immediately the fields the squares the quays the streets of the city the palace courts and all the rooms in every house were rid of their croaking occupants and restored to their original condition the king smiled proud of the skill of his wise men it is not enough to have dispelled aaron's enchantment said inanna i am now going to repeat it inanna waved his wand in an opposite direction and pronounced a different formula in an undertone the frogs instantly reappeared in greater number than ever jumping about and croaking and in the twinkling of an eye the land was covered with them but aaron stretched out his rod and the egyptian magician could not remove the invasion brought about by his own enchantments it was in vain that he repeated the mysterious words the incantation had lost its power the college of hieroglyphists retired abashed and thoughtful pursued by the vile plague pharaoh wore an angry frown but he was still obdurate and would not hearken to the prayer of moses 
his pride would hold out to the end against this unknown god of israel however not being able to rid himself of the ugly reptiles pharaoh promised moses that if he would intercede for him before his god the hebrews should be permitted to go and sacrifice in the desert the frogs died or returned to the water but pharaoh's heart grew hard again and in spite of tahoser's gentle remonstrances he did not keep his promise and now all manner of plagues and scourges were let loose upon egypt a mad struggle took place between the hieroglyphists and the two hebrews whose prodigies they imitated moses converted the dust of egypt into insects anana did likewise moses took two handfuls of ashes and threw them up toward heaven as he stood before pharaoh and immediately a red pestilence broke out and the skin of the egyptian people was covered with an eruption that did not touch the hebrews imitate this miracle said pharaoh beside himself with rage his face as red as though the flames of a furnace were shining upon it to the chief hieroglyphist where would be the use responded the old man in a discouraged tone of voice the finger of the unknown is in all of this our vain formulas are of no avail against this mysterious force submit to it and suffer us to return to our sanctuaries that we may study this new god this almighty one more powerful than amon ra than osiris and than typhon the science of egypt is surpassed the enigma guarded by the sphinx is meaningless and the great pyramid covers but an empty void with its enormous mystery as pharaoh still refused to let the hebrews go all the cattle of the egyptians died but the israelites did not lose one a south wind rose and blew all night and when the day dawned an immense reddish-brown cloud veiled the entire sky through this tan-coloured mist the sun glowed like a buckler in the forge and seemed to be stripped of its rays this cloud was different from any other cloud it was alive there was a rustling sound through it and a fluttering of wings and at last it descended upon the earth not in great drops of rain but in layers of pink yellow and green locusts more numerous than the grains of sand in the libyan desert they followed each other in whirlwinds like straws before the tempest the air was dark and dense with them they filled the ditches the ravines the watercourses they extinguished with their numbers the fires kindled for their destruction where they encountered an obstacle they collected in heaps about it until they surmounted it if you opened your mouth one was sure to enter they lodged in the folds of your garment in the hair in the nostrils their thick ranks drove back the chariots knocked down solitary wayfarers and soon hid them from sight the formidable army jumping and flying went up and down over egypt from the cataracts to the delta covering an immense extent of land mowing down the grass reducing the trees to skeletons eating up the plants to their roots and leaving nothing behind them but the ground bare and empty as a threshing floor at the prayer of pharaoh moses caused the plague to disappear an east wind of great violence carried all the locusts into the red sea but this stubborn heart harder than brass porphyry and basil would not relent hail a scourge unknown to egypt fell from the sky amid blinding flashes of lightning and deafening peals of thunder its enormous stones cutting and breaking everything before them and levelling the wheat like a scythe then a black opaque and frightful darkness in which the lamps went out as they do in the depths of the tombs where there is no air settled down with its black clouds over the land of egypt so fair so luminous so sunny beneath its azure sky whose night is clearer than the day in other climates the terrified people believing themselves already enclosed within the impenetrable darkness of the sepulchre groped their way along or sat down beside the propylons moaning and rending their garments one night a night of terror and gloom a spirit passed over egypt entering each house whose doorway was not stained with blood and all the first-born male children died the son of pharaoh as well as the son of the most miserable parashite 
yet the king in spite of all these terrible signs would not yield he remained within his palace silent and unapproachable gazing at the body of his son extended upon the funeral bier with jackal's feet unconscious of the tears with which tahoser bathed his hands moses loomed up on the threshold of the room without waiting to be announced for the servants had fled in every direction and repeated his demand with imperturbable solemnity go said pharaoh at last and sacrifice to your god as you like End of section twenty nine this recording is in the public domain section thirty of egypt africa and arabia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world story volume three egypt africa and arabia edited by eva march tappan section thirty the victory over the kita by penta ur thirteen twenty six b c put into meter by hardwick d ronsley by order of rameses this poem was inscribed upon the walls of five temples one of which was at karnak on these walls were also engraved enormous illustrations of the scenes of the poem commemorating especially the exploits of the king the editor then the king of Kita land with his warriors made a stand but he durst not risk his hand in battle with our pharaoh so his chariots drew away unnumbered as the sand and they stood three men of war on each car and gathered all in force was the flower of his army for the fight in full array but advance he did not dare foot or horse so in ambush there they lay northwest of kaddish town and while these were in their lair others went forth south of kaddish on our midst their charge was thrown with such weight our men went down for they took us unaware and the legion of pra horm aku gave way but at the western side of arunatha's tide near the city's northern wall our pharaoh had his place and they came unto the king and they told him our disgrace then rameses uprose like his father month in might footnote month or mentu as one of the aspects of the sun-god ra was worshipped at thebes End of footnote all his weapons took in hand and his armor did he don just like baal fit for fight and the noble pair of horses that carried pharaoh on low victory of thebes was their name and from out the royal stables of great Mayamun they came then the king he lashed each horse and they quickened up their course and he dashed into the middle of the hostile hittite host all alone none other with him for he counted not the cost then he looked behind and found that the foe were all around two thousand and five hundred of their chariots of war and the flower of the hittites and their helpers in a ring men of masu keshkesh padasa maluna arathu quazadana kadesh akarith leka and kilabu cut off the way behind retreat he could not find there were three men on each car and they gathered all together and closed upon the king yea and not one of my princes of my chief men and my great was with me not a captain not a knight for my warriors and chariots have left me to my fate not one was there to take his part in fight then spake pharaoh and he cried father amon where 
art thou shall a sire forget his son is there aught without thy knowledge i have done from the judgments of thy mouth when have i gone have i e'er transgressed thy word disobeyed or broke a vow is it right who rules in egypt egypt's lord should err before the foreign peoples bow or own their rod whate'er may be the mind of this hittite herdsman horde sure amon should stand higher than the wretch who knows no god footnote the king probably is here identifying himself with amon in the footnote father amon is it not that to thee i dedicated noble monuments and filled the temples with the prisoners of war that for thee a thousand years shall stand the shrines i dared to build that to thee my palace substance i have brought that tribute unto thee from afar a whole land comes to pay that to thee ten thousand oxen for sacrifice i fell and burn upon thine altars the sweetest woods that smell that all thy heart required my hand did ne'er gainsay i have built for thee tall gates and wondrous works beside the nile i have raised thee mast on mast for eternity to last from elephantin's isle the obelisks for thee i have conveyed it is i who brought alone the everlasting stone it is i who sent for thee the ships upon the sea to pour into thy coffers the wealth of foreign trade is it told that such a thing by any other king at any other time was done at all let the wretch be put to shame who refuses thy commands but honour to his name who to amon lifts his hands to the full of my endeavour with a willing heart for ever i have acted unto thee and to thee great god i call for behold now amon i in the midst of many peoples all unknown unnumbered as the sand here i stand all alone there is no one at my side my warriors and chariots of feared have deserted me none heard my voice when to the cravens i their king for succour cried but i find that amon's grace is better far to me than a million fighting men and ten thousand chariots be yea better than ten thousand be they brother be they son when with hearts that be like one together for to help me they are gathered in one place the might of men is nothing it is amon who is lord what has happened here to me is according to thy word and i will not now transgress thy command but alone as here i stand to thee my cry i send unto earth's extremest end saying help me father amon against the hittite horde then my voice it found an echo in hermonthus temple hall amon heard it and he came unto my call and for joy i gave a shout from behind his voice cried out i have hastened to thee ramses myamon behold i stand with thee behold tis i am he own father thine the great god ra the sun lo mine hand with thine shall fight and mine arm is strong above the hundreds of ten thousands who against thee do unite of victory am i lord and the brave heart do i love i have found in thee a spirit that is right and my soul it doth rejoice in thy valour and thy might then all this came to pass i was changed in my heart like monthu god of war was i made with my left hand hurled the dart with my right i swung the blade fierce as baal in his time before their sight two thousand and five hundred pairs of horses were around and i flew into the middle of their ring but my horse hoofs they were dashed all in pieces to the ground none raised his hand in fight for the courage in their breasts had sunken quite and their limbs were loose for fear and they could not hurl the dart and they had not any heart to use the spear and i cast them to the water just as crocodiles fall in from the bank so they sank and they tumbled on their faces one by one at my pleasure i made slaughter 
so that none e'er had time to look behind or backward fled where he fell did each one lay on that day from the dust none ever lifted up his head then the wretched king of Kita he stood still with his warriors and his chariots all about him in a ring just to gaze upon the valour of our king in the fray and the king was all alone of his men and chariots done to help him but the hittite of his gazing soon had fill for he turned his face in flight and sped away then his princes forth he sent to battle with our lord well equipped with bow and sword and all goodly armament chiefs of lika masa kings of maluna arathu karkamash of the dardanai of keshkesh kalabu and the brothers of the king were all gathered in one place two thousand and five hundred pairs of horse and they came right on in force the fury of their faces to the flaming of my face then like monthu in his might i rushed on them apace and i let them taste my hand in a twinkling moment's space then cried one unto his mate this is no man this is he this is satek god of hate with bale in his blood let us hasten let us flee let us save our souls from death let us take to heel and try our lungs and breath and before the king's attack hands fell and limbs were slack they could neither aim the bow nor thrust the spear but just looked at him who came charging on them like a flame and the king was as a griffin in the rear behold thus speaks the pharaoh let all know i struck them down and there escaped me none then i lifted up my voice and i spake ho my warriors charioteers away with craven fears halt stand and courage take behold i am alone yet amon is my helper and his hand is with me now when my mena charioteer beheld in his dismay how the horses swarmed around us lo his courage fled away and terror and affright took possession of him quite and straightway he cried out to me and said gracious lord and bravest king save your guard of egypt in the battle be our ward behold we stand alone in the hostile hittite ring save for us the breath of life give deliverance from the strife o protect us ramses myamun o save us mighty king then the king spake to his squire halt take courage charioteer as a sparrow-hawk swoops down upon his prey so i swoop upon the foe and i will slay i will hew them into pieces i will dash them into dust have no fear cast such evil thought away these godless men are wretches that in amon put no trust then the king he hurried forward on the hittite host he flew for the sixth time that i charged them says the king and listen well like baal in his strength on their rearward lo i fell and i killed them none escaped me and i slew and slew and slew End of section thirty this recording is in the public domain chapter thirty one of egypt africa and arabia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world's story volume three egypt africa and arabia edited by eva march tappan section thirty one finding pharaoh eighteen eighty six by edward l wilson in the neighbourhood of the thirty three hundred years ago the land of egypt from goshen to thebes and beyond was in an uproar the king was dead rameses the second the precocious youth who at the age of ten had joined his warrior father sethi the first upon the throne the ruler whom his people regarded as a god the oppressor under whom the israelites are said to have sighed by reason of their bondage the great sesostris of the greeks had breathed his last the gay and busy life of the cities of the delta was hushed and the hundred gates of thebes were only open to those who ministered to the necessities of the living or who performed the sacred offices of the priesthood 
all street processions minstrel bands and mountebanks fled appalled the cities which the great architect and artist king had refounded rameses and python built by the forced labor of the hebrews were in their meridian splendor the ramesseum at thebes was yet unsurpassed and the colossal monolith which represented the enthroned king was then unbroken the glorious quartet of abu simbel but recently finished sat as now smiling at the nubian sun but rameses the second in whose honor for whose glory and by whose command all these grand creations were finished could look upon them no more with mortal eyes his body was embalmed and in due season the funeral procession followed the mummied king was placed aboard the royal barge and attended by the priests and the image of the gods horus and isis and hathor was floated up the nile to the theban city of the dead to biban el mulouk the st denis the westminster abbey of the kings and a great lamentation went up to the skies from stricken egypt as the funeral cortege journeyed slowly on the frantic people of the cities and villages flocked to the quays to render homage to their dead ruler even the despised and persecuted hebrew suspended labor betimes because his cruel overseer had forgotten him the men rent their garments the women tore their hair and all gathered up the dust and threw it upon their heads tens of thousands of funeral offerings were cast into the sacred river and the gods were called upon to attend the dead throughout the sacred journey it was a dire day indeed when the sad company had arrived at the necropolis all the complicated funeral rites were conducted with priestly ostentation then the body of rameses was sealed in the great sarcophagus which had been cut from the limestone of Ibn el maluk the location of the tomb was well known then because it had been the habit of the monarch to visit it frequently during its excavation more than once had the architect announced that the tomb was ready but he was as often met with the command to excavate still other vaulted halls and longer passages and side chambers all to be finished with stuccoed walls adorned by representations in relief of the processions of the gods of the life and work of the king and of the scarabaeus the emblem of immortality moreover all were to be richly coloured there is plenty of time for all that and much more before i am ready said rameses and he returned to his capital but he died before the work was completed according to custom after the burial the doorway to the tomb was walled up and so disguised by rocks and sand as to make it impossible for any but the priest to discover its whereabouts and although his original tomb that of his father sethi the first and that of his son Meneptah, had long before been discovered they were empty and until july eighteen eighty one the real hiding-place of the pharaoh of the oppression was a mighty secret then its door was opened and soon after history in a measure repeated itself the story of its finding is more romantic than any told in egypt since isis gathered the scattered remains of osiris and buried his head within the alabaster temple at abydus for a number of years the acute officials of the museum of antiquities at bulak had seen funeral offerings and other antiquities brought from thebes by returning tourists which they knew belonged to the dynasty of rameses the second of his father sethi the first and of his grandfather rameses the first even scarabees bearing the cartouche of the great king were displayed by the innocent purchasers this being so argued the clear-headed officials the mummies of those royal personages must have been discovered by some one by whom professor maspero the director-general of the bulak museum at once organized a detective force to help him solve this conundrum arrest after arrest was made and the bastinado was applied to many a callous soul which had never felt even shoe or sandal the women stood by and browbeat the sufferers into silence while they endured the torture and the men refused all information in a line of tombs beyond the rameseum lived four sturdy arabs named abadir rasul 
they supplied guides and donkeys to tourists who desired to visit the ruins of thebes and sold them genuine and spurious antiquities when they found a mummy it being forbidden by law to sell it the head and hands and feet were wrenched off and sold on the sly while the torso was kicked about the ruined temples until the jackals came and carried it away i purchased a head and hand of one of the brothers amid the dark shadows of the temple at Quernay. early in eighteen eighty one circumstantial evidence pointed to ahmed abedur rasul as the one who knew more than he would tell professor maspero caused his arrest and he lay in prison at kenna for some months he also suffered the bastinado and the browbeating of the women repeatedly he resisted bribes and showed no melting mood when threatened with execution his lips told no more than the unfound tomb and not as much finally his brother mohammed regarded the offer of bakshish which professor maspero deemed it wise to make as worth more to him than any sum he might hope to realize from future pillaging and made a clean breast of the whole affair how the four brothers ever discovered the hidden tomb has remained a family secret on july five eighteen eighty one the wily arab conducted herr emile brugge bey curator of the bulak museum the deir el bahari and pointed out the hiding-place so long looked for a long climb it was up the slope of the western mountain till after scaling a great limestone cliff a huge isolated rock was found behind this a spot was reached where the stones appeared to an expert observer and tomb-searcher to have been arranged by hand rather than scattered by some upheaval of nature there said the sullen guide and there the enterprising emil bruch bey with more than egyptian alacrity soon had a staff of arabs at work hoisting the loose stones from a well into which they had been thrown the shaft had been sunk into the solid limestone to the depth of about forty feet and was about six feet square before going very far a huge palm log was thrown across the well and a block and tackle fastened to it to help bring up the debris when the bottom of the shaft was reached a subterranean passage was found which ran westward some twenty-four feet and then turned directly northward continuing into the heart of the mountain strait except where broken for about two hundred feet by an abrupt stairway the passage terminated in a mortuary chamber about thirteen by twenty-three feet in extent and barely six feet in height there was found the mummy of king pharaoh of the oppression with nearly forty others of kings queens princes and priests not until june eighteen eighty six was this most royal mummy released from its bandages that event is my plea for telling now what i know of the romantic finding and the place thereof a few months after the finding took place accompanied by my camera i visited the bulak museum and photographed the entire find emil bruch bey is also an amateur photographer and we had already fraternized during the centennial exhibition of eighteen seventy six where the egyptian section was in his care therefore at bulak i not only enjoyed a rare privilege at his hands but also his friendly advice and assistance the photography done we embarked upon the khedive steamer beni suef for luxor there we were met by professor maspero and mohammed abedur rasul and together we visited the scene of the latest drama of the nile when we reached the chamber of the dead the rope which had hoisted the royal mummies from the tomb was made fast to our bodies was swung over the palm log and we were lowered into the depths as i dangled in mid-air and swayed from side to side the rocky pieces which i started from their long slumber warned those who preceded me to look out below at the bottom of the shaft on the right and left wall of the entrance to the subterranean chamber were written in black ink some curious inscriptions by whom no one can more than conjecture it was the duty of the ancient inspector of tombs to make frequent visits to the royal dead to repair the mummy cases and wrappings and if necessary to remove all to a safer tomb this handwriting on the wall may have been that of the pharaonic tomb 
inspector whose duty it was to make record of every change professor maspero being desirous of having photographs made of these inscriptions the little american camera was set for the work and succeeded in securing them even there in the bowels of the earth then lighting our torches and stooping low we proceeded to explore the long passage and the tomb at its terminus the rough way was scattered with fragments of mummy cases shreds of mummy cloth bunches of papyrus leaf lotus flowers and palm leaf stalks while here and there a funeral offering was found after much stumbling we arrived at the inner chamber where but a few weeks before stood or reclined the coffins of so many royal dead the camera must have a long time for its delicate difficult work and so we did not need to hurry seated upon a stone which for centuries had served as the pillow of priest or king while waiting for immortality herr bruch told me the whole story of his historic find it was a unique interview it made such an impression upon my mind that i can repeat the story here from memory though i do not of course claim that the report is verbatim finding pharaoh was an exciting experience for me said my companion it is true i was armed to the teeth and my faithful rifle full of shells hung over my shoulder but my assistant from cairo ahmed effendi kemal was the only person with me whom i could trust any one of the natives would have killed me willingly had we been alone for every one of them knew better than i did that i was about to deprive them of a great source of revenue but i exposed no sign of fear and proceeded with the work the well cleared out i descended and began the exploration of the underground passage soon we came upon cases of porcelain funeral offerings metal and alabaster vessels draperies and trinkets until reaching the turn in the passage a cluster of mummy cases came into view in such numbers as to stagger me collecting my senses i made the best examination of them i could by the light of my torch and at once saw that they contained the mummies of royal personages of both sexes and yet that was not all plunging on ahead of my guide i came to the chamber where we are now seated and there standing against the walls or here lying on the floor i found even a greater number of mummy cases of stupendous size and weight their gold coverings and their polished surfaces so plainly reflected my own excited visage that it seemed as though i was looking into the faces of my own ancestors the gilt face on the coffin of the amiable queen nefretari seemed to smile upon me like an old acquaintance i took in the situation quickly with a gasp and hurried to the open air lest i should be overcome and the glorious prize still unrevealed be lost to science it was almost sunset then already the odour which arose from the tomb had cajoled a troop of slinking jackals to the neighbourhood and the howl of hyenas was heard not far distant a long line of vultures sat upon the highest pinnacles of the cliffs near by ready for their hateful work the valley was as still as death nearly the whole of the night was occupied in hiring men to help remove the precious relics from their hiding-place there was but little sleep in luxor that night early the next morning three hundred arabs were employed under my direction each one a thief one by one the coffins were hoisted to the surface were securely sewed up in sailcloth and matting and then were carried across the plain of thebes to the steamers awaiting them at luxor two squads of arabs accompanied each sarcophagus one to carry it and a second to watch the wily carriers when the nile overflow lying midway of the plain was reached as many more boatmen entered the service and bore the burden to the other side then a third took up the ancient freight and carried it to the steamers slow workers are these egyptians but after six days of hard labour under the july sun the work was finished i shall never forget the scenes i witnessed when standing at the mouth of the shaft i watched the strange line of helpers while they carried across that historical plain the bodies of the very kings who had constructed the temple still standing and of the very priests who had officiated in them the temple of hatasu nearest away across from it Kurne, farther to the right the ramesium where the great granite monolith lies face to the ground farther south medinat abu a long way beyond the deir el medineh 
and there the twin colossi or the vocal memnon and his companion then beyond all some more of the plain the line of the nile and the arabian hills far to the east and above all and with all slowly moving down the cliffs and across the plain or in boats crossing the stream were the sullen labourers carrying their antique burdens as the red sea opened and allowed israel to pass across dry shod so opened the silence of the theban plain allowed the strange funeral procession to pass and then all was hushed again when you go up you will see it all spread out before you with the help of a little imagination when we made our departure from luxor our late helpers squatted in groups upon the theban side and silently watched us the news had been sent down the nile in advance of us so when we passed the towns the people gathered at the quays and made the most frantic demonstrations the fantasia dancers were holding their wildest orgies here and there a strange wail went up from the men the women were screaming and tearing their hair and the children were so frightened i pitied them a few fanatical dervishes plunged into the river and tried to reach us but a sight of the rifle drove them back cursing us as they swam away at night fires were kindled and guns were fired at last we arrived at bulak where i soon confirmed my impressions that we had indeed recovered the mummies of the majority of the rulers of egypt during the eighteenth nineteenth twentieth and twenty-first dynasties including rameses the second rameses the third king pinotum the high priest nebseni the queen nefretari all of which you have seen and photographed at bulak arranged pretty much as i found them in their long-hidden tomb and thus our museum became the third and probably the final resting-place of the mummy of the great pharaoh of the oppression thus was the story of finding pharaoh modestly told me by my friend who had displayed such enthusiasm and tact in securing for science what had puzzled science for so long a time to discover when we ascended from the tomb i grouped my companions at its mouth and once more caused the camera to secure a link of history professor maspero reclined upon the rocks at the right emil bruch bay stood at the palm log and mohammed was posed in front holding the very rope in his hand which had served in hoisting royalty from its long-hidden resting-place the next day the shaft was filled up again thus closing the door of the empty theatre for the drama was ended and the actors were gone i made a long nile journey after that and photographed many a stone-cut permanent likeness of the michael angelo of egypt the profile of the southern colossus of the great temple at abu simbel has all these centuries retained the beautiful expression left it by the nubian chisel and presents a striking resemblance to the photograph of the recently unfolded mummy of the great king of this unfolding the world has been told by almost every newspaper in it when i was at bulak all i could catch of the sesostris face and form was as it appeared after the last neat work of the inspector of tombs had been finished since the unfolding which took place june one eighteen eighty six the camera of bruch bay has enabled us all to see how pharaoh looked likewise the report of professor maspero giving the particulars of his removal of the wrappings has ever since been a topic of conversation all over the wide world only fifteen minutes were occupied in undoing the labor of many days by the careful embalmers the kingly body had reposed in peace at least twice as long as was enjoined by the faith of isis in order to secure immortality as recently as eighteen eighty it was offered to an american traveller for a reasonable bakshish but declined because its genuineness was doubted but no doubt now exists for in black ink written upon the mummy case by the high priest and king pinotum is the record testifying to the identity of the royal contents then upon the outer winding sheet of the mummy over the region of the breast the indisputable testimony is repeated the coverings being all removed by the careful hands of professor maspero in the presence of the khedive and other distinguished persons rameses the second appeared professor maspero further reports the head is long and small in proportion to the body the top of the skull is quite bare on the temples there are a few sparse hairs but at the pall the hair is quite thick forming smooth straight locks about five centimetres in length 
white at the time of death they have been dyed a light yellow by the spices used in embalmment the forehead is low and narrow the brow ridge prominent the eyebrows are thick and white the eyes are small and close together the nose is long thin arched like the noses of the bourbons and slightly crushed at the tip by the pressure of the bandages the temples are sunken the cheekbones very prominent the ears round standing far out from the head and pierced like those of a woman for the wearing of earrings the jawbone is massive and strong the chin very prominent the mouth small but thick-lipped and full of some kind of black paste this paste being partly cut away with the scissors disclosed some much worn and very brittle teeth which moreover are white and well preserved the moustache and beard are within they seem to have been kept shaven during life but were probably allowed to grow during the king's last illness or they may have grown after death the hairs are white like those of the head and eyebrows but are harsh and bristly and from two to three millimetres in length the skin is of earthy brown spotted with black finally it may be said the face of the mummy gives a fair idea of the face of the living king the expression is unintellectual perhaps slightly animal but even under the somewhat grotesque disguise of mummification there is plainly to be seen an air of sovereign majesty of resolve and of pride the rest of the body is as well preserved as the head but in consequence of the reduction of the tissues its external aspect is less lifelike the neck is no thicker than the vertebral column the chest is broad the shoulders are square the arms are crossed upon the breast the hands are small and dyed with henna and the wound in the left side through which the embalmers extracted the viscera is large and open the legs and thighs are fleshless the feet are long slender somewhat flat-soled and dyed like the hands with henna the corpse is that of an old man but of a vigorous and robust old man we know indeed that rameses the second reigned for sixty-seven years and that he must have been nearly one hundred years old when he died on the same day that the face of the great sesostris was unwrapped the mummy of rameses the third was also revealed and his identity established beyond question and now these old-time kings stand in the glass cases of the bulak museum in as close companionship with pinotim and nebseni as they were when found in their sequestered retreat once kings princes and priests monarchs tyrants and oppressors equal with the gods they now appear labelled and numbered as antiquities where all who desire may go and face them without fear when they were first born to the tomb their frightened subjects cried to the gods for their entrance into immortality and one of those gods was rameses the second represented at pithom in red cyanite seated in an armchair between the two solar gods ra and tum but when they were carried back to the delta the folds of sand which had for centuries covered their ancient city zoan were being unwrapped by the spade and pick of the egyptian exploration fund and their frightened descendants cried unto allah the god of israel End of section thirty one this recording is in the public domain.